Continuing with AS Level Computer Science 9618, getting into topic 7.1, Ethics and Ownership. Let's take a look at the learning targets just like we always do. So candidates should be able to show an understanding of the need for and purpose of ethics as a computing professional. So they want us to understand the important importance of joining a professional ethical body, including the BCS and the IEEE, which we will talk about today. They also want us to show an understanding of the need to act ethically and the impact of acting ethically or unethically for a given situation. So we'll be going over all of it today. And by applying that, you'll be easily able to get your points on your Cambridge 9618 AS level exam. So let's dive in with ethics. So there are things to consider when we use the word ethics and what we consider ethical behavior. We have to take into account legality. Is it legal? Is the act punishable by law? Morality. Is it right or is it wrong? Now, more often thought of in dealing with personal choices, we hear, we, you know, we think of the word morality and then we have ethics, questions of right and wrong, but more on a professional or in a professional context. And then the culture, what are the attitudes of society? It's the practice and values shared by society in its groups of people. So that leads us into computer ethics. Now, computer ethics is a set of principles set out to regulate the use of computers. Now, three factors are taken into account with regards to computer ethics. Intellectual property rights. An example of this would be using a YouTube video that was not created by you for personal gain. Copying of software without permission of the owner is another example. Privacy issues. An example of hacking or illegally accessing data that belongs to another person. And the third one is the effect computers have on society. Job losses with the advancement of AI, social impacts, and so on. Uh, you know, AI is becoming a bigger part of the world and that can lead to some job losses. One of the things that uh, my students are talking about is the future uh, where there will be no cashiers because everybody has uh, self-checkout lines, but that's for another another day. Let's keep going. So the BCS is a British Computer Society. It's a professional body set up in the UK it was originally set up to represent the rights and ethical practices of all professionals working in the IT and computing industries. Now at present, it now embodies international groups and monitors and advises various IT practices around the world, what's acceptable and what is not acceptable. Now the BCS has a code of conduct and it covers four topics. The first one is the public interest, professional competence and integrity, duty to relevant authority, and then duty to the profession. So that also ties in to the ACM and the IEE Software Engineering Code of Ethics. So we're gonna cover it all in one. So the Associ Association for Computing Machinery, the ACM, and the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers are based in the USA, but they have an influence globally. Now, consider the ethics they have defined, but the codes of practice in other countries those are important too. They stress that the public interest is the central focus for the code and the code presents a set of fundamental principles. They say a professional should make an ethical judgment based on thoughtful consideration of these fundamental principles. Now we're gonna outline those in just a moment. The code they talk about has eight principles and each principle is expanded into what they call clauses. Now each clause refers to a specific aspect that should be considered in the context of that principle. You can use this, you know, like a checklist that gives a framework for ethical judgment. So let's go over these principles. So principles one to four. The first one is public. Software engineers shall act consistently with the public interest. Two, client and employer. Software engineers shall act in a manner that is in the best interest of their client and employer consistent with the public interest. The third one is product. Software engineers shall ensure that their products and related modifications meet the highest professional standards possible. And I feel like today we are not seeing that in uh, all kinds of software. I feel, in my personal opinion, that is lacking, but that's okay. Judgment. Software engineers shall maintain integrity and independence in their professional judgment, meaning they will not be influenced by somebody else. They'll maintain their own independent thought and have integrity. So let's move on to principles five through eight. The fifth one is management. 
software engineering managers and leaders shall subscribe to and promote an ethical approach to the management of software development and maintenance. Six is profession. Software engineers shall advance the integrity and reputation of the profession consistent with the public interest. Seven is colleagues. Software engineers shall be fair to and supportive of their colleagues. And number eight, self. Software engineers shall participate in lifelong learning regarding the practice of their profession and shall promote an ethical approach to the practice of the profession. In almost any career field that you enter uh, today, you're gonna be using uh, self a lot, whether you're a uh, software engineer or not. Almost every career field will have you constantly uh, go to what they call professional development and participate in lifelong learning to make your practice or craft even better. So those are the principles, but how many total clauses are there? Okay, so there are 80 clauses for those eight principles, the numbered from 1.01 to 8.09. Now, to include all of them would be wasteful, as little can be gained from reading all of them in a PowerPoint, and this video would go on forever. So I'm gonna see if I can print, if you're in my class, I'll see if I can print your handout so you have them to refer to. After I find it, I will post a link in the description uh, below shortly after this video is uh, posted. So when we talk about how many total clauses, there's a lot. Now, many of the clauses do not refer to software engineers, but to the proper behavior for any group of professionals. And here are some examples that would not just apply to software engineers. For example, 2.03, use the property of a client or employer only in ways properly authorized and with the client's or employer's knowledge and consent. You're not gonna use you know, the property of a client or employer in a way that's not approved by them. 5.04, assign work only after taking into account appropriate contributions of education and experience tempered with the desire to further that education and experience. Another example, ensure realistic quanti uh, quantitative estimates of cost, scheduling, personnel, quality and outcomes on any project on which they work or propose to work and provide an uncertainty assessment of these estimates. And the last one that we have here that is just an example of the clause is 6.06, .06, obey all laws governing their work unless in exceptional circumstances, such compliance is inconsistent with the public interest. So we keep talking about the public interest and the public good. So what is it? Well, when the question of public good arises, there are some things to think about that help the safety and welfare of the public, the public interest, the public good, the public concern. Now we'll go over some individual cases to show what might be considered when thinking about some of these. Uh, the Ariane 5 rocket exploded 40 seconds after takeoff in 1996. Now to the detriment of public good, around $500 million were spent with no benefit to anyone at all. It exploded because of one line of code. It tried to convert a 64-bit floating point number to a 16-bit integer. So this crashed the program and unfortunately also uh, the rocket. The NASA Mars Climate Orbiter was supposed to orbit Mars to study the climate there. The probe made it to Mars, but failed to get stuck in Mars's orbit. So it's just out there floating around somewhere. The cause was the software was supposed to use the standard metric system for all calculations. Well, one group of software engineers used the imperial system of units rather than the standard metric system. This only caused a problem with the calculations of getting the Mars orbit. This cost the public around $125 million. Now, these examples that we just went over are about the public interest in successful software engineering. The correct application of the code of ethics with respect to specification and testing of software could have saved a lot of money because these projects were funded by taxpayer money and we could have saved a lot of money uh, there if the testing of software had been done properly. So that's one example of public good. A different type of disaster is a system that never gets built. In 2011, the UK scrapped the national program, that should be one M, not two, the national program for IT and the National Health Service, which begun in 2002. The entire project never produced a workable system after nine years, and it cost the public around 12 billion pounds with startup costs around 3 billion pounds. So we have 15 billion pounds 
to start and you know the national program for IT and the National Health Service, which never took off. So just 15 billion dollars or 15 billion pounds down the drain. Now, software engineers are not to blame, but if we correctly apply ethics, the part of the code of ethics specifically targeted at project management would not have allowed this type of fiasco to occur. So if management had done their job, maybe this could have been averted. Now, the examples we talked are related to the cost of the public. In contrast, there are many examples with computer-based systems where the nature of the endeavor or what it has led to is concerning. So we're going to look at the next slide for some uh, examples and I have some real life examples. So powerful commercial companies being able to exert pressure on less powerful companies to ensure that the powerful company's products are used when alternatives might be more suitable or less costly. Companies providing systems that do not guarantee security against unauthorized access would be another concerning example. Organizations that try to conceal information about a security breach that has occurred in their systems, that is another concerning example. And there are even more impacts that, can, um, that ethics can have on the general public. Some other issues and examples that can affect the general public include companies that sell software to you that do not meet the standard that is required for security. They leave you vulnerable to malware and other issues regarding security. You go out and you buy, you know, an antivirus, some type of anti-malware program, and it doesn't work like it should. It's not meeting that standard. And there are lots of companies that do that. Several cloud servers became compromised, known as the ZEN, or the ZEN, the XEN, known as the Zen threat. Cloud operators tried to cover up what had happened, but eventually the truth came out. A cloud server was hacked and several celebrity photos were linked and private personal data was released. That's a big, big problem. Social media ignoring subversive activity like cyberbullying and hate email. You know, Facebook or, you know, their company now is Meta. They have never talked about cyberbullying and hate email. They're just talking about what they're going to be doing now that they're Meta. Several countries are paying very close attention to this uh, right now. Search engines, they're being controlled by large companies with big pockets. These companies pay to have their website or company at the top of a search engine. Go to Google, type in something, you'll see, you know, sponsored by ad or, you know, ad sponsored. Those are companies paying big bucks to have their results at the top. Just searching laptop computers brings up several companies that have paid to have their search results at the top. And here is an example. So just typing in laptops, you can see these are sponsored. We can see Dell, the Microsoft store. You can see Dell has paid for several uh, advertisements. Portable Portal from whatever that is, I'm not really sure. But these are companies that have paid because they are sponsored. They are paying to be at the top of the search engine. And you can see in 1.12 seconds, we were able to get that search back with, you know, 1.7, 1.79 billion results. So obviously nobody's going to go through all those results, but companies know that people are not going to go through tons of websites. They're going to do what is most convenient. And these companies are paying for that. Now that is concerning because they're able to out advertise and pressure the small companies because there are alternatives available to these mainstream laptops in these mainstream companies. But they're putting pressure on the other ones and the other ones just can't compete even though there are some good alternatives out there. So um, why do we see things like this? Well, why do you see these ads? Well, ads from uh, Adorama were shown to you based on your current search terms and it's automatically enabled, show ads. Ads from Apple, show ads from Apple, ads from Best Buy, show ads from Best Buy. These are automatically done when you click on these companies. Ads from Dell were shown to you based on all these different things here. Automatically, show ads from Dell, show ads from Microsoft. All of these are here. Ads from Microsoft were shown to you based on your current search terms. They're watching everything you do to show you specific advertisements right here. Office Depot uses advertising and measurement services from datasearch.net. Depending on your browser settings, datasearch.net may store cookies in your browser if you interact with this ad. In one place, uh, here's uh, Facebook. 
So they were shown to you based on uh, your current search terms, ads from Sam's Club, which is like Costco, ads from Target, and then Verizon, Walmart, HP. All of these get automatically enabled on your computer and they're watching everything you do. Is that ethical? Is that right? Does it violate one of the eight principles? That is something for you to think about. Uh, if you like this video, if you found it helpful, please like and consider subscribing to help the channel grow. We'll see you guys in the next one.